Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. John Diard. Welcome to the Life Spa podcast, where we talk about ancient medical wisdom and modern science. And today we have a really special guest. He's a PhD in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, his name is Nick Huell, and he's got a company called Hewless Performance Technologies. And he's created some amazing technology uh, around vagal stimulation. And he's created this device here called the uh, the V Relief Prime, where you actually stimulate your vagus nerve in different parts of your body. We're going to dive into the vagus nerve, what the vagus nerve does, <clears throat> so why we need vagal stimulation, and uh, all the research that he's done on vagal stimulation, particularly with the V Relief Prime, which is an amazing, amazing device. I just really felt compelled to share that with everybody. So here we go. Nick, welcome to the show. Really appreciate your time. Um, Tell us, I mean, I think probably the best thing to start is, I mean, vagal stimulation is sort of like, you know, the buzz right now, but maybe we can start with like, what is vagal, vagal stimulation and what is the vagus nerve and why is that important? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, the, I guess like my personal story is, plays a huge kind of role in why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I learned about the vagus nerve. Um, I, I'll kind of just tell you a little bit about how I got into vagus nerve stimulation. Um, and as I go, you know, I'll tell you what it is. But um, I first learned about the vagus nerve when I was getting my PhD in biomedical engineering. I got um, my education at Arizona State University under um, one, you know, some world neurostimulation expert who had done, you know, decades of research using electrical um you know, energy to stimulate nerves in the body, as well as other modalities to stimulate the brain um, and nerves for mental health conditions. And so um, I first learned about the vagus nerve in school. And what interests me about it was I read a paper that showed how when you electrically stimulate a small branch of the vagus nerve in your ear area, it causes a drop in your heart rate. And in some cases, within like seconds, you'll see just an immediate drop in your heart rate. And I, I saw that and that intrigued me because when I grew up, I, I grew up playing competitive golf. And as a competitive golfer, you know, oftentimes you get really nervous and, you know, your heart's beating out of your chest. Um, and for me, you know, I developed sort of a form of performance anxiety where this happened I frequently or did happen it was so severe that I couldn't even like think straight I didn't know where the heck I was and what's going on um, just not a fun experience at all obviously and so when I you know I guess that experience led me to want to go to school to study that response in the body like what is physically going on when I'm in that you know anxious state and are there non-drug ways that we can turn that off and just get back to a state of calm, you know, without taking medications or drugs or without spending all this time trying to like breathe your way out of it or do mindfulness. Um, again, th those techniques are great, but in the middle of an episode, I wouldn't like for me, I did, they didn't work fast enough. Like I, I needed something that could just pull me out of it quickly. Um, so I studied you know, that response in the body in school, learned about the vagus nerve and was intrigued when I saw the research showing how it can literally suppress the physical symptoms of a stress response. And so that was my first introduction to the vagus nerve. I didn't know a whole lot about it at the time, but then started researching and realizing that this nerve really is like the body's built-in system for helping people, helping your body recover from a fight or flight response. Like that's the main job. Um, and I mean, there's tons of other, you know, conditions that it plays a role in, but again, its primary role is to kind of help you balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So uh, a lot of research shows that when your body is in a fight or flight state, sympathetic, you know, state, that vagal nerve activation techniques uh, help you out of that and get you back into the rest and digest state. And so to me, it was just like, that makes sense. Like that's the technology that I needed when I was playing golf. 
Um, but I didn't understand it at the time. And so at a high level, understanding the role of the vagus nerve and how it helps you kind of get back to that state of calm. I started researching what are all the vagal nerve activation technologies, techniques, like what's out there. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff out there. There, you know, the vagus nerve's been pretty popular for the last decade, but I think it's really exploded in popularity um, just post COVID because a lot of people, um, you know, started researching, you know, what's going on with my imbalanced nervous system, right? Because COVID knocked everybody's nervous systems out of balance, and all of a sudden it's more difficult to heal from things. And so, as people are looking into um, you know, how to recover from COVID, people start to realize, oh, the vagus nerve plays a huge role in balancing your nervous system. Um, and so, you know, there's all kinds of vagus nerve activation techniques, like slow breathing. Uh, you probably heard of like ice, you know, ice to your face or getting in a, a cold um, shower, or a cold plunge. And those are all really great. Uh, but, you know, every activation technique is it's a little different. Some of them are are longer uh, techniques. It takes a long time to get the effects from them, like humming or breathing. That takes a while. Um, some of them, like cold, not really practical if you're like out and about and all of a sudden uh, you're having an anxious moment. But electrical stim is really cool because it's an instant activation technique. You get immediate vagal activation. And at least with the design that we have with our device, we made it really small and portable and discreet. So you can take this with you anywhere, use it discreetly in any situation without drawing public attention to yourself. There's no setup time. It's not like this big chunky medical device, right? It's just a really simple, you take the lid off, you apply it to the side of your neck and you just experience the relief. Like yeah, oftentimes- Within seconds. Out of the bus, just going like that, you know, no one would really know, right? You know, yeah. Pretty, yeah. So that was kind of a long uh, backstory into what I know about the vagus nerve, how I got into it. But, um, you know, I think it's it, it's important, at least for your, you know, everyone to understand. I'm not like the go to guy for all things vagus nerve, uh, but I definitely have, you know, a good understanding of. Um, one specific side of the vagus nerve, the auricular branch of it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a lot of my own research in clinical studies, testing our devices too in that area. So, you know, when I, uh, when I got the device, um, I, I was out of the country for a couple of weeks and, and uh, we got back and I'm opening up my mail and, and uh, there it was, you know, the, the, this really awesome device. So I was super excited about it. But that night is when, um, I don't know if you're into college football, but the whole, you know, Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, yeah. he, that's when CU was playing CSU, this big game. It was one of the first games that put, you know, CU football on the map. And now it's like a national crazy thing. Um, <clears throat> and we were, and so I wanted to watch that game, except for the fact that, we were like falling asleep. So I said, well, let me try this thing, you know, cause we were sort of jet lagged and exhausted. So I took it and I'm stimulating it myself and then did both sides. And, and I kind of, you know, sort of got a perky feeling. Like I felt like I woke up, like it rejuvenated me from the exhaustion of that, like, right. you know, and then, and then I was like watching the game and I looked over my wife, she's like out cold, you know, she's asleep. So I went behind the couch and I took the thing. I said, Hey, can I do this to you? And I stimulated her. And she, uh, you know, was able to kind of, I don't know, and I'm, I'm wondering if that was, uh, you know, just a placebo kind of wishful thinking, but I really kind of felt like that, that parasympathetic rest, digest, rejuvenate activation is sort of, it's sort of just, you know, it's not a vague, it's not a, a, a fight or flight stimulation, but it seemed like it gave us a level of rejuvenation from deep chronic circadian stress of jet lag. I wonder if, if you could comment on that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely like, there's the arousal side of stress, right? Where you're like every part of your body's fired up. And then there's the opposite, which is, I guess you could call it fatigue, right? Where due to stress, like don't feel like moving and 
you're you got mild brain fog maybe you're not really thinking straight um yeah we had we've had a lot of people report uh you know improvements in those symptoms improvements in fatigue um definitely it helps with mental clarity when right. your brain is not really like focused uh, right. that we get a, we get a lot of feedback on that i haven't done I haven't done any per, like research advice for fatigue or things kind of on that side of stress response. I we primarily do it on the arousal side, um, showing right. that we can calm people down. But there's sure. a lot of a lot of research, especially in the last you know two three years uh, since COVID coming out, showing how auricular and cervical vagus nerve uh, are just really effective at helping people recover from chronic fatigue. Uh, brain fog, a lot of these other, um, you know, symptoms associated with, you know, being in a chronically stressed state. So yeah, it made it made sense to me because you know, you know, jet lag is a pretty massive stress to the body. People yeah. don't realize how how impactful it is, and then and then and then shifting the body back into parasympathetic rest and, and rejuvenate kind of you know neurology. It seemed like it just gave us a level of rejuvenation, mental clarity, and we just felt, you know, like sort of like not so, you know, jet lagged. It was kind of a cool experience. I also wonder um, the electrical stim. You mentioned like you know breathing versus you know cold plunges or or you know the humming and all these techniques that do really work. Do those techniques actually train the nervous system to be more parasympathetic dominant, where the electrical stim uh, uh, is more of a instant relief kind of thing, um, where you become more dependent on it. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, is, does, yeah. does one, are they all the same? Do they all kind of, you have to do it all the time or does one actually train the body to become more resilient or does one actually create a dependency? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes to every question. Um, they are all the same. They all do train the nervous system they to some degree can create a dependency but not like a not the same type as like a drug where your body like you go into withdrawals if you don't have like that's not gonna happen um so from basically the way we know that these techniques are having a long-term effect on your body is we look at least what i've looked at there, there's a few other variables but the main one is heart rate variability that's right. kind of the main indicator of vagal tone. Vagal tone is just a term we use that describes the health, the strength of your vagus nerve and the vagus nerve response. If you have a high vagal tone, it means you have a strong vagus nerve. Um, if you have a low vagal tone, it means you have your vagus nerve. And so people with low vagal tone tend to, um, you know, be more chronically ill. They recover from sickness slower uh, they're not necessarily more prone to getting stressed out and anxious but uh, it it takes them longer to recover from a stress response versus people with high vagal tone are much more efficient at calming themselves quickly um, they're generally healthier uh, they heal faster from chronic illnesses and, and sickness things like that and so the the question about you know breathing versus um, cold plunge versus electrical stim. You, all of those, if you do them every day over time, you will strengthen your vagus nerve response. Like we do see increases in your baseline HRV over time. Nice. It's just a question of which one works the fastest, which one is most effective, which one requires the least amount of my time to put towards it, right? Those things are very important. Um, and so the from what I've seen, the most powerful ones in terms of speed would be cold plunge and electrical stim. And when I say cold plunge, I mean like get your whole body into a, a cold tank. But that, I mean, that's painful. Like your average person is not gonna do that because it's just, it, it's like suffering for five minutes. Um, but it really effective at helping your body shift and recover. And, you know, there's all kinds of stories of people saying like cold plunge changed my life. Like I I'm healed from all these chronic conditions. Um, but very difficult to 
to commit to that, right? Electrical stim is really cool because it's simple, right? You're not, it's not painful at all. There's no, there's no real commitment. There's no like mental workup when you're about to go do it. Um, and you're directly activating the nerve. It's not like a kind of an indirect method where like slow breathing sort of is a, a longer form process of activating the vagus nerve. Um, so yeah, or like there's one study that I'm thinking of, they did a, a, a two weeks with individual aged 50 and older where they did auricular vagal nerve stem every day for two weeks, 20 minutes a day. Uh, and they saw off the top of my head, I, I want to say it was like maybe a 30% increase in the baseline HRV after two weeks of daily stim. So what that means is they it, it's not like they measure HRV right after a session. They, they take your baseline just as is. You do this every single day and you come back, take another baseline two weeks later, and their baseline HRV is higher. Uh, and I mean, that's what we're looking for, right? Um, we see similar effects with our device, um, you know, see, I guess, I guess that's the main thing is like, which technique is going to get you that increase in HRV faster and with less effort. Um, and there's pros and cons to all of them, right? Like cold plunge is probably the fastest, but most effort, most suffering, and, you know, um, oh, yeah. Also, I think a cold plunge is, you know, it's it's quite an elaborate setup. You know, you can't yeah. just jump in a cold plunge. You have to get a make a tub, throw ice in it, or buy a special tub. It's it's quite um it's not something you can necessarily do unless you're completely into it and set up for it. For the average person, you can carry this along along with you. Um I wonder um is there a risk of like overstimulating the parasympathetic? nervous system where you then need arousal to get back um or is and i know that you've done a lot of safety um studies on this maybe we should talk about that first make sure that you know the safety talk about that but also you know is there a risk where sometimes you need that arousal and this if you if you overstimulate the parasympathetic do you end up becoming sort of like you know too relaxed in life yeah yeah i mean really great questions and uh, a lot of these questions were you know, questions I had when I was doing my uh, PhD research and I set out to answer these questions. Uh, the first was, you know, is it safe just in general? And uh, the technology is like at its core, its foundation, it's um, it's called uh, transcutaneous electrical stimulation. So like a TENS unit, basically. So electrical nerve stimulation has been around for decades. I mean, if you really want to say it's been around for thousands of years, right? Like, um, you know, ancient societies have been using electrical, like fish to, um, you know, heal certain things. So electricity, we know it's safe for the body and it, a lot, like certain forms of it is really healthy for the body and it heals the body. So our technology, we're like right in the middle of, the same electrical wave that have been used for decades and all these other devices. Um, so we're, you know, we're using a really safe waveform that's been proven, you know, in thousands of, you know, participants and studies that it's safe. So um, that's really the most important thing is knowing that you're not going to harm yourself when you use our product. The second is, is it safe to stimulate the auricular branch? We know it's safe to apply electrical stim to the body, but in particular is the vagus nerve, is it safe to do, to hit that nerve? And so this is where understanding kind of the, the physiology and the anatomy of the nerve is really important. Um, a lot of the hypotheses in the early days were saying you cannot stimulate the right side of your auricular vagus nerve because it projects to the heart. You mean the left? They'll, no, they'll say the right. It's crazy. People don't understand like what's going on here. People make all kinds of, you know, hypotheses that just, so a lot of people say you can't stimulate the left, can't stimulate the right. You can't do both at the same time. And that was another one of my questions is like, well, why not? Because in my prototyping and testing, I stimulate everything all at once. And I'm like, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm monitoring everything on my body. 
and I'm not seeing any like anything to be concerned about. And so I, we looked into the anatomical studies, cadaveric studies. Um, basically, the auricular branch of your vagus nerve is purely an afferent nerve, meaning it only travels to the brain. It does not have any direct connections to the body. That's oh. both left and right. So it's there's you're not going to have any like direct impact on the heart. The brain acts as a filter, basically, for any impact it's going to have on your body. And so basically, you're going to cause like bradycardia or you're not going to have any um, serious adverse events with, you know, heart related adverse events by stimulating the auricular branch of the nerve. The cervical branch of the nerve, which is on the front side of your neck, that does have direct projections to the heart. And it's right next to some baroreceptors. Um, so like if you apply too much pressure, you'll see a drop in your pressure. You'll, you will see a drop in your heart rate like immediately. Uh, and in a lot of cases, that can be dangerous for, say, patients with heart disease or patients with high blood pressure. Uh, so it's really important to understand that when you, just because you say it's a vagus nerve stimulator, it doesn't mean it's activating like all of the vagus nerve at once. It's a very specific branch of it. And the branch in particular that we're going after is very safe uh, because there, again, there are no direct projections to the body. It's not going to have, um, you know, any effect on causing bradycardia, which is the most, uh, the biggest concern. And we've never seen that in any of our research. I, I've, I've never once seen someone get bradycardia from um, hitting the auricular vagus nerve. So that basically, yeah, it, it's a very safe technology. Um, and in years, you know, there's been no serious events from it. So. So that's amazing. I love that. I didn't know that that the auricular branch was just afferent, which means it goes to the brain and then all the benefit you get is top down, right? So it goes to the yeah. brain and then the brain sends a message. Hey, the bear is not chasing you. You can relax. You can recover. You can rejuvenate. You can digest. You can do all those things that the parasympathetic system is, you know, in charge of. So that leads to like a really important question. You take this prime device and you open it up. Um, and then you stimulate it. I've seen pictures where some people on, you know, are way up high underneath the ear, just behind the jawline. And I've seen pictures of it kind of down low. So where's the precise placement for this thing? Yeah. So we tell people it's, it's right in the soft spot, just underneath your earlobe pressed okay. up against your jawbone. It's a little region. It's called the tympanomastoid fissure. You just, it's a little okay. soft spot in there. And it's kind of like, kind of want to press it where it's like up against your earlobe even too so you know you can like come down and you can get auricular activation you know even down below the neck but when you're hitting the the auricular vagus you want to be kind of up in that soft spot um the auricular vagus is mostly innervated in the inner side of your ear but then as it goes to the brain it kind of goes down a little bit through that tympanomastoid fissure and then it goes to your brain stem so we're just lighting it up right in that spot um but the the other thing too to to think about is this is something i've learned and um no one knows this because it's such a new concept like people are still trying to learn like what exactly is going on when you're doing this the the reason this works it's not it's not the vagus nerve in like particular that this is helping you calm down. It's it's the top down effect from your brain to your body. So really what we're doing is we're activating the brain's relaxation response through this peripheral nerve. It's like a computer when you're plugging in a USB, right? Like, like I can access all the computer's internal, you know, components and tell it to do things by plugging something in to the side and I can now access certain things. Uh, kind of like with the peripheral nerves, right? Like I can hack into the brain's processes through this peripheral nerve. Uh, and so all these auricular nerves, both great auricular nerve and the auricular vagus nerve, they both travel and synapse in the same region in your brain that's responsible for that top-down um, relaxation response. 
So that's why some people will hold it lower and they'll still feel the same benefits. Um, yeah. It, because honestly, it's it's the same mechanism of action. Like even if you come way down, you're still getting that brainstem activation. Um, you know, in the same way I described, you would get it with auricular vagus. So yeah, I'm I'm actually doing it right now. I feel like a vibration going throughout my whole ear, and it's actually very comfortable. Um, this is what makes this device so amazing. I've you know you know as a chiropractor doing muscle stim electrostimulant people for decades um you always have to wet the contacts to create an electrical current what nick has created here is these little gel condu conductors here that you can replace or re-soak and they last a really long time and you don't have to worry about you know putting a bunch of gel on your neck and all that you just take this thing out and do it and um what's kind of neat about it is um is that um, you know you can you, it doesn't feel like sometimes if you have electrical stim it can feel real or a tens unit they're really aggressive and they kind of stain a little bit. This one doesn't really have that effect at all, which I think is really why it's so special and so unique in the industry of uh, of vagal stimulation. And also you got to think about this like this is like when you meditate. Your meditation tells your brain and your whole physiology to relax and your brain gets this message, your brain waves change and then the brain waves and the brain top down says, now we're in parasympathetic dominance. You can relax, rebuild, rejuvenate, digest better. That's exactly what Nick has created is when you do this auricular stimulation, you're actually sending this message of calm to the brain and the brain tells everybody else to relax, which is as, as opposed to you just, you know, outright manipulating your nervous system to do something it may not really want to do because you're not actually you know overruling the body's intelligence you're sort of working with the body's intelligence and that's why it's sort of like meditation in your hand in the sense does that make sense nick yeah oh 100 and you know that's kind of the the why i wanted to make this is meditating while it's awesome and super beneficial it just takes such a long time to get into the right meditative state. Uh, and so for people on the go or for people that aren't disciplined, maybe to practice it all the time, this is just an awesome tool that kind of gives you all the benefits within minutes, right? Not all the benefits, at least the benefits, right? Uh, the other side of meditation where you're like actually contemplating different perspectives, that's, that's also really uh, important to do that. But, you know, this device, you know, kind of can put you in that meditative state very quickly. So, yeah, well, let's let's talk about the science and give everybody just to remind you, we're listening. We're talking to Nick Hool. Uh, he's the founder of Hoolis Performance Technology. He created this uh, V-Relief Prime and on the link below, you can get uh, click on that. I'll take us to his site and learn more about it. And and um, but let's talk about uh you know, some of the research you've done on this device. Uh, I know you did one with golfers. You're a golfer. Why don't you tell us about that first? Yeah. So being a golfer, obviously, you know, that was my biggest passion. And my, my first interest was let's see how this impacts golf performance, um, golf stress, things like that. Um, so that was part of my PhD research was, you know, let's get some golfers and let's, you know, let, let's go out onto the golf course, have them hit some balls and, and see what this does. Um, what we did, we went to a driving range and we had them hit 150 yard golf shots. Um, and we would, we'd have them hit 10 shots as a baseline and then 10 shots post or uh, stimulation. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what we did, but we threw in some stressors just to make, um, you know, try and get them a little bit stressed out and thinking about the performance. I think it had to do with like, we'd give them money every time they hit it in the target. And then, oh, that's what we did. And then after the 10 shots, they would, they'd accumulate money by hitting it in the target. And then at the end, we would have them like hit, they had one shot and it had to land in the target if they were to keep all the money they've made at all this far. So they're either going to lose all the money they've made or they'll keep it. Uh, and that was, it actually works. Like people think about it a little bit and they're like, Oh, I, I actually felt a little bit stressed out and anxious. And so in that study, 
what we found was the at least for a 150 yard golf shot there was no impact on performance uh, like accuracy wasn't any different um you know it's not like i mean that was really the main thing we were looking at was accuracy uh, and frequency of hitting the target we didn't see any changes between the active and placebo groups but what we did see was the the mental side of it we saw um, a significant increase in the, the subjective feel of each shot. And so in golf, especially your feel of each shot is like the most important thing to get dialed in. Uh, if you're going to ever be in the zone, like anyone that has ever been in a flow state or, you know, in the zone will tell you they're not thinking mechanically about what they're doing. They're feeling it, right. They're just doing it subconsciously. And so the ability to lock into your feel is extremely important in athletic performance and really in any type of performance in life. And so we were able to demonstrate that the active group we saw, it, like, I think it we doubled the subjective sense of feel of each shot um, after the stimulation versus the placebo group, there was no change. So they didn't feel any different hitting their shots um, after the fake versus the real stem they said like my feel is better which is good that's subjective and then um we were able to see increases in heart rate variability um in the active group versus the placebo uh and then state anxiety as validated by um, a clinically uh validated anxiety questionnaire uh, we were able to show 36 percent decrease in state anxiety after the stim versus, I think it was 18% decrease in the placebo group. So about double, um, you know, the decrease in the active group. So, yeah, I mean, that was cool. Um, we, we showed that, you know, using the device in a golf setting makes, it makes you feel better. Like when you're hitting your shots, like not like feel better as in, oh, I just feel so good. No, like the quality of my swing feels more aligned with what I'm trying to do. Uh, which is extremely important. Uh, but we, I, I don't have any, uh, any on my site because it was a different study, but I was also part of a couple different putting studies. So hitting 10 foot putts. In that one, we were able to show that putting performance increased after stimulation um, in the active group versus the placebo. You know, we were able to show that 10 minutes of the stim increased subjective feel of your putts but they also made more putts and the uh, the missed putts on average were closer to the hole in those that got the stem versus those that didn't and so that one i can definitely validate just with my own experience i definitely make more putts when i use this on the golf course like it's just the, it's a thing like when you can calm your body and have a smooth you know, motion, your shoulders aren't tense. You're not like breathing really fast. You hit smoother putts. And if you hit smoother putts, you're going to make more putts. And so it, it definitely works on uh, like movement that requires fine motor control um, and being very calm. So I, I would love to do like darts one day, <laughs> like go see if it helps people throw more accurate darts um we did archery once but the study was too small we didn't we didn't make it all the way through with that one um but that's kind of that, that was kind of the conclusion i made in that study was uh it, it's not going to have a huge impact on performance for like big bulk motion things like that but for fine motor movements um you know it will have a greater impact on performing under pressure which was cool Could you just could you describe what state anxiety is? And also um, just for folks to make sure everybody knows what heart rate variability actually is, what's actually happening in the heart when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. State anxiety is it basically how anxious you are in this moment. Like what's your current state of anxiety? Do you have a lot of it or none of it? Um, it's just a, a way that we can quantify, you know, using numbers, like what is your current state of anxiety? Because um, as you know, anxiety, it's all, it really is subjective. It's a feeling, right? It's really hard to quantify, like how much exact anxiety are you feeling right now by like 
looking at your body. It's hard to do. Um, but state anxiety is a questionnaire that you can take. Uh, I think it was created in the early 70s, maybe, but it's been around for a long time. Um, and they use it to diagnose various you know, anxiety disorders. Um, and then heart rate variability is uh, one method that you can objectively use to quantify anxiety levels. Um, it's not perfect. It, it, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be the only thing you rely on, but heart rate variability is basically a measure of the average change in your heart rate over time. So everyone's familiar with your heart rate, right? Like your heart rate is 70. That's what it is. It's beating at 70 beats per minute. Heart rate variability is just a measure of like, sometimes your heart rate is going up and it's at 80 beats per minute. And sometimes it goes down. Now it's at 60 beats per minute. HRV is a measure of that fluctuation. And it's, it's, a, it's complicated to measure, but um, the, like the simplest way that I can describe it is, is yeah, it's just um, like measuring how much it's changing and everyone's heart rate is always changing. If your heart rate is just stuck at, at one number, it one, it's never going to be stuck there. If it was perfectly stuck, you would be dead. Um, but everyone's heart rate is always changing. And so think about it. Like if you're sprinting, your heart rate's going to get really high, right? But you're not going to see a lot of fluctuation. It's going to stay really high. And so when your heart rate is not fluctuating a lot, that means you're in a fight or flight state. So, you know, if it's going like up and down by just a couple beats per minute, typically that indicates your body is in a stressed out fight or flight state. But if you see these big ups and downs in your heart rate over time, and when I'm, I'm talking like, you know, if you're measuring this on the scale of like minutes at a time, you can see it in real time. You know, most people when they're relaxed, their heart rate will be, you know, around 70. Uh, you'll see it go up to like 80 for a few seconds, and then it'll go down to 60 for a few seconds. And, and it just kind of does that swing over time. A lot of people think like, oh, there's something wrong with me. My heart rate's swinging all over the place. But no, that's actually good. Like you want to see those big swings in your heart rate because it indicates your nervous system is healthy and it's capable of recovering from a stressed out state. So people that have high heart rate variabilities, they're still going to experience a stressor like everybody else, right? Their body will still go into that fight or flight state. The difference is they're more capable of recovering faster and more efficiently than someone with a low heart rate variability. They'll get the same fight or flight response, but they're going to stay there for a while because they're they're not able to like get those swings coming down, right? So they tend to get stuck in the fight or flight state uh, more often than people with higher heart rate variabilities. Um, hopefully that uh, was but helpful. I, I kind of was struggling to explain that as clearly as I probably could have. But no, I think I think it was great. I, I always say, like, you know, if you're super stressed out, your your nervous system is going to be like boom, 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 boom. Like to doing everything it can to be like as rigid, like like soldiers marching, you know, into battle. You know what I mean? It's that's sort of a stressed out state. But when you're like in heart rate variability, the higher it is, the more the heart rate is going up, it's going down. It's like it's like it's very resilient and it's just going with the flow. It's not like like yeah. lockstep, you know what I mean? And that's a fight or flight situation. And when you're relaxed and the heart rate is moving and resilient to stress, that's a an indicator of more parasympathetic activity. That's kind of how I how I look at it. You did some, I thought it was great, like what you said. And I, I actually said a few things I didn't know, so that's awesome. Um the uh you did a study on what's called targeted neuroplasticity. And in Ayurveda, you know, we do talk about pranayama breathing techniques and, and how breathing can be extremely effective for changing your brain waves and so on. Um, um almost every pranayama breathing technique that I looked at the research in provided some level of neuroplasticity. And almost every breathing technique that I looked at increased parasympathetic dominance or activated the vagus nerve. But you did a study on targeted neuroplasticity training 
Uh, I think it was about for having folks learn languages. Can you talk about that study? Yeah, so that one, that was, uh, I guess, the first study I was a part of in my PhD program. Um, I that, that was my very first year. So I joined that. I was kind of like the, you know, the last guy that had any real impact on making that study happen. Um, I think I was like fourth on the list of authors for that. Um, but that was my first study where I got to see this technology like in action. And targeted neuroplasticity was just a term for saying we're being hyper precise about what nerve we're targeting. Um, at that study, we were targeting the vag auricular vagus nerve in the ear canal. Um, the thought was that we wanted to design an electrode that you could wear and that looked normal. It didn't look like this wonky thing you're sticking, your, you know, wires to yourself. So we were like, if we can design like an earbud electrode, people can put it in their ear and it'll look like they're, you know, listening to music or something. So the concept behind that was, you know, let's let's just make a really invisible, essentially, a vagus nerve stimulator. We targeted it in the ear canal. Um, and then the, I don't remember all the specific details of that one. And the goal was we wanted to see if people could recognize certain, um, audio cues in different languages more effectively. Um, specifically I, we were, uh, we were doing it to, to see if we could have people learn Chinese faster. So if people that got auricular stimulation, essentially would it would it put your brain in a state where you could retain information better and be more focused um you know during a training session ultimately so that you can master a language in less amount of time uh, and we the the way we did it was there were like certain sounds in the chinese language that we were having people listen to um, and they had to like push a button anytime they had a certain sound um, and certain words. And we were able to show that those that got the auricular stem were better at identifying the, the sounds they had to listen to in the different language. Um, and they, they identified the sound, you know, more accurately and at a greater frequency than those that got the placebo. So again, it's not like we weren't able to demonstrate, you know, like, oh, these people learned Chinese and became fluent in X amount of time. Like it, it was more just like, let's let's see if we can help people like identify certain tones with more accuracy, um, you know, and um, I guess more effectively using vagal nerve stem. And we were able to, to show that. So there's a lot of conclusions that you could make with that data. Um, obvious conclusion was, if your brain is able to identify certain audio, you know, sound or, uh, you know, sounds in language more effectively, then you should be able to learn a language fast, more efficiently. But on the other side, you could also suggest that your brain is better at performing under pressure when you have to focus on something. You know, you're like, think baseball, for example, when they're, when a pitcher's throwing a ball, you got to be locked in and be hyper focused. Um, and we never did those studies with our device, but there are other studies that I've read how stimulating auricular nerves um, and baseball players they were able to to see that improvement in focus. Um, so, yeah, at a high level, that's really what that study was about: was just showing that you know by stimulating the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. People were more focused. They were more tuned in to sounds, and they could identify, um, you know, certain words in a different language more effectively than those um, that didn't get the stim. So, yeah, kind of kind of improves focus, I guess, is kind of the uh, takeaway of that study. And then you um, you also, I think, did a study on um, PTSD. And uh, you had some pretty powerful results uh, with panic and panic disorder and that kind of a thing. Can you uh, take us through that? Yeah. So this one is, this is the best one that we've done. The study was small, but thus far, 
you know, the, the most common and the most powerful feedback that I get from our customers and our users are those with PTSD and, and panic disorder. And maybe they're not diagnosed, but they're at least living with, you know, those types of symptoms. Um, what we did was we got 24 individuals with self-diagnosed PTSD or panic disorder. Um, and so a lot of military vets came through this one, but we had them come into our office and uh, we would have them take, I can't remember the name of the test, but there's a certain math test that is so simple, but so difficult that it causes everyone to be stressed out. You're just adding like, like small numbers together in a, like in a short amount of time. And it's just funny because like it would literally cause like a panic attack in certain people because it's just, it's such a stressful test. And we tell these people that we're like, look, this, this test has been known to induce a panic in certain types of individuals. Do you consent to doing this? And of course they, they consent. Um, but what we did was we get them in that stressed out state, right? We, we get them stressed. We get them, um, you know, as, you know, as close to the real world condition as possible. And then we give them either the real device or the placebo. And we were able to, again, to demonstrate that only the active device showed a significant reduction in their state anxiety levels. The placebo, um, while it did reduce it, it wasn't significant um, compared to the active device. And then subjectively, we had 100% of those that used the active reported that it was relaxing and that it, you know, essentially pulled them out of their stress response. And then only 33% of the placebo reported the same. So that's a pretty big difference, right? When, you know, it's it, again, not a huge um, stamp, uh, sample size, but 100% of them said that it, it made them relaxed and it pulled them out of their stressed, you know, stress response. And that's the most common feedback I still get to this day is people living with PTSD, panic disorder, or people that just frequently get anxiety episodes, panic attacks. They'll tell me like, this thing pulls me out of it, you know, within seconds. And I don't go anywhere without it because if I'm out and about and all of a sudden I, you know, go into one of these panic states, you know, the device, you just pull it out of your pocket, apply it within seconds and you know, very quickly you can recover from that. So I would say that's definitely the most impactful study that we we did thus far. Um, and I mean, it's, it's probably amazing. the biggest impact it's had on on people in general to this it's day. Well. You, you really do get, um, you really do feel quite a difference when you do this thing. I, uh, I sort of fall in love with this thing. It can, you know, it's obviously you can do it when you play golf. There's a great golf story, a Ben Hogan story. You probably remember that story where he was playing golf and he was uh, putting a, a very long putt to win the tournament. And right when he was pulled back the putter to hit the ball, a train came by, blew its whistle. Everybody in the in the audience was like, oh my God, they were like freaking out. How could he, he's going to miss the putt and the train. Oh my God, it was bad luck. He sinks the putt. In the interview after the, uh, after the uh, tournament, after he won, um, they're going, oh, Mr. Hogan, that was amazing. And what a great, you know, round of golf and tournament. What did you think when that train came by and blew its whistle? And he was like, what train, you know? He had no idea. He was just completely focused on that. And I think that's what happens when you get into off that fight or flight state, you get into more of a relaxed state where you can feel and you can, you know, in an Ayurveda, like the system we practice, we always think, we think way too much. People have incessant thoughts. They can't stop thinking and they can't actually access their gestalt. They can't access who they truly are. And we're constantly, you know, fighting all these crazy thoughts, good thoughts, bad thoughts, you know, our whole world is depending on good things happening outside of us. And, and this allows you to access that inner silence. You know, I call it the eye of the storm. The bigger the calm, the more powerful and productive you are in the world. But if you're living in the winds of the storm, dodging refrigerators all day long, stress, 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 it's dangerous out there. But if you can get your nervous system to be calm in activity, the bigger the calm, the more powerful, productive you are, and the more you enjoy life from the inside out. You're not, you know, running the risk of getting super super stressed out. I really love this thing. 
I love I also meditate and breathing, do all the things, but I find this thing to be a really cool adjunct. Um, and um, I've been using it on a lot of uh, patients and, and friends and family, and they adore this thing. They love it. You've got, I think, four different settings for, you know, different frequencies that you generate with this device. Can you go over what those frequencies are for? Yeah, so the Prime is definitely our best product, and it's got five different modes of operation programmed into it. We have three different uh, frequencies that it outputs. And then I'll explain the other two in a, in a second. But um, frequency just means the number of electrical pulses per second. So uh, we have a, an 8 hertz frequency. We have a 25 hertz and a 100 hertz frequency. Hertz is the um, it's just the unit of measurement of frequency. But so 8 hertz, for example, eight pulses per second. So you'll, you know, we get eight of those energy pulses and a hundred is a hundred pulses per second. At a high level, the difference between them is just the perception of it. So you'll feel the individual pulses at eight hertz, whereas a hundred hertz, it feels like a smooth sensation. So fast, you can't feel the individual pulses. And so what we've learned in the last decade is that nerves will respond differently to different frequencies. Um, and sometimes the same nerve will, will respond differently to different frequencies at the same time. So like, you know, one day 100 hertz might have some effect on the vagus nerve, and then the next day it's not doing anything. And then if you switch the frequency, all of a sudden you'll get, an, you know, the same effect as before. Which, um, so nerves are just interesting in how they respond to different frequencies. But we, we chose 8 hertz, 25, and 100 because those were the top three most used waveforms and frequencies in auricular vagal stem research. Um, the 100 so far is the most popular. Um, and it's at least in the last couple of years, I've started to see that waveform kind of present itself as the most effective in activating auricular vagal nerve. Um, afferents. And I think 100 hertz is the most comfortable. And in the beginning, our main thing was, you know, it like comfort is the most important factor here. If it's not comfortable, no one's going to use it. Um, at the time, 25 hertz was the most common frequency used when I was developing this, but it wasn't as comfortable. And I was just like, look, we got to go with 100 hertz because it's the most comfortable one. And all the data that I was collecting was showing that it's equally as effective, if not more effective, at you know activating that parasympathetic response. So we went with it, um, and yeah, I mean now there's just, there's more research coming out showing that 100 hertz is you know more effective than the lower frequencies. Um, but having the multiple frequencies at least gives people options, um, you know, to use just different modes they can try one if it doesn't work they can try a higher frequency or a lower frequency and maybe if their nerve isn't as responsive to that frequency today like it has been in the past we'll change the frequency do a different one you know your nerve you know will respond differently when it gets hit with a different stimulus um, so at, as a at a high level that's why we have different frequencies um, one thing that's really cool, we don't really promote this um, just because it's it adds a little bit of complexity that we're not quite ready to handle yet in customer support, but you can actually use the Prime to target other peripheral nerves in your body. The way that it's designed is you, you can literally, like in the same way you can press it against your auricular, you can press it against your trigeminal in your forehead. You can press it against other facial nerves. You can even do cervical vagus nerve if you want right here on the front of the neck. Um, I tell people like you can do it on your median nerve. So all these different nerves, uh, you know, there are other devices out there um, that are either wellness devices or they're FDA cleared, but they have certain benefits, uh, health benefits like trigeminal is great for headache pain. If you have a headache, you can stimulate trigeminal and you know, it disrupts the pain signal and effectively you don't feel the headache pain when you're doing it. 
which is really great. Um, median nerve, great for wrist pain or arthritis or nausea even. Um, you know, a lot of data shows this is good. So all those different frequencies, again, you can play around with it and target other nerves as well. And so really this device, you've got a real multi-purpose nerve stimulator here beyond just simply helping yourself calm down, um, which is really cool. Um, I forgot it. I've got my little ASU Sun Devil on the back of my device here. So, um, yeah. and then uh, the other two modes are there, we call them the uh, breath training modes. So we've got one mode that cycles up and down at, at a certain rate where when you synchronize your breathing to the ups and downs, it guides your breath to either a six breath per minute breathing rate or a three breath per minute breathing rate. And so those are, those are known as like slow breathing uh, routines. And the slow breathing routine is just another kind of way of activating your vagus nerve. And man, I found that when you stimulate the auricular and you do the slow breathing at the same time, it's like the most powerful, or at least I would say the most potent calming sensation that I've found. Um, it works, you know, almost immediately you feel like a lightness in your head, but like a heaviness in your body. It's a strange sensation, but, um, you know, though we, we put two of those modes in just to help kind of train people on how to slow their breathing down. Um, and when you, you know, combine it with the stem, it's a lot more effective than just using one or the other. So yeah, those are the modes. No, those are great. Thank you so much. And they, they really, that breathing thing is amazing. You know, you could actually do the breathing or you could do the humming. You could really, you know, create uh, a beautiful, uh, you know, technique for yourself to really kind of calm yourself down and get into a meditative state. And this could be like a pre meditative activation that really, when you do go into meditation, it can be really even more deep. Um, there's always, there's a lot of talk about the brain gut, gut brain uh, connection, the uh, HPA access, the idea that um, we handle stress through our intestinal tract, through the second brain. There's a big Ayurvedic thing. The seat of the nervous system is in the gut. They talked about that thousands of years ago. Now we have science to prove that, that that's in fact true. Does this affect, do you ever have, do you ever get any feedback that this sort of top down effect helps people have? Because it's, you know, parasympathetic system is also known as the rest and digest nervous system. So when you're eating, you're relaxed, you digest better. Eating on the run, gobbling food, getting chased by a bear, not a good time to order pizza. It's a time where you're getting you're everything stimulating survival. Um, the parasympathetic activation is when you're stimulating, you're rebuilding and rejuvenating and digesting and nourishing yourself. Do anybody do you have any reports on folks feeling that they're digesting better from this relationship with the gut brain or changing their microbiome or having any of those digestive issues get resolved? Yeah, we get, we I get a surprisingly a lot of feedback and reports that it helps with digestion a lot more than I've ever expected. Um, the Actually the very first practitioner who adopted our product was using it for digestion purposes um, and the, the, the sign that she was explaining to people that, you know, it's working is when you feel like a gurgle in your stomach. Oh, wow. Um, and it, at least for me, I've learned that it doesn't happen all the time. It's like, you have to kind of have to time it right. If you do it right before you eat a meal and I don't know, within 10 minutes or so after eating a meal, that seems to be when I noticed like the gurgle the most. Uh, my wife will do it and she notices the gurgle a lot more than I do in my stomach. Um, we have a lot of other chiropractors and um, other holistic health practitioners who will use our products for digestion purposes. Um, I haven't done any like studies with, with our device for digestion, but there's a lot of auricular vagal nerve stem studies out there that have demonstrated that you know it improves digestion, um, you know, gut motility, a lot, just gut related health. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. Um, I'm not particularly an expert in gut health. Uh, actually, I'm not an expert at all in gut health. But yeah, I mean, it. it's again, it's kind of like that 
the brain gut connection, right? Like we're activating the part of your brain that sends a signal to your body telling it to slow down. It sends a signal via the vagus nerve. So like the vagus nerve, because it innervates the gut too, you're getting signals sent to your gut. And so, you know, to the degree of, of success, I, I don't know how like often it's going to have improvements in digestion. I don't know if there's certain types of individuals that will, will respond better to it. Um, but definitely like there's an impact for sure. Um, hmm. And I, I would venture to say that it would help those most that have the most severe conditions. Um, hmm. If you're generally healthy, you may not recognize the, the effects as, uh, as clearly, I guess. But So Nick, it comes with um, a little canister of extra um, conductors, right? How do you know when to change these out? Yeah, so these gel tips, uh, like you said, these are our proprietary gel electrodes that don't require any uh, soaking or saline, which just massively improves the user experience. Uh, but the material that they're made out of, in order to make it comfortable, you know, we had we did. I've spent probably a year and a half testing all kinds of different materials, uh, combining you know, like certain liquids together and trying to make like a dry liquid, which is like a weird concept. But the electrodes that we're using, it they start out kind of moist and they're a little bit slippery uh, because they are like water-based uh, at, at its foundation. And so because they're water-based, they will dry out over time. Um, and typically they last about a month before you see that, you know, they, they start to shrink and then once they start to shrink, they'll either just fall out of the device or they'll get so dry that it starts to become uncomfortable and it starts to be a little bit prickly. Uh, it doesn't hurt. It's just a little uncomfortable. And that's the time when you should replace them. Um, you definitely want to have, you know, the freshest electrodes possible for the most comfortable experience um, and for the most effective experience. Um, and so at least with the the prime gel tips, they last about a month, which is like, pretty incredible. Um, in some cases, you know, some people say it lasts two months. So the use case varies. You know, it's, it's not going to last on the dot a month. There's no expiration date on them. Um, use them as long as you can get a comfortable stimulation from them. Uh, so we, about a month is what we see. Do you have to put anything on, like wet them at all? Put anything on them to make them feel more comfortable sometimes if they're starting to dry out? Yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, you know, everyone has different skin sensitivity levels. So some people, you know, they're really extra sensitive to that stem. And so for those people, I always tell them, you know, use like a skin lotion or a moisturizer and put it on your skin. Don't put it on the electrodes. It's usually a skin dryness issue. And once uh -huh. you kind of moisturize your skin, I mean, it makes a huge Im improvement in what it feels like and it eliminates a lot of that, um, you know, discomfort. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not talking like you got to soak yourself in a big glob of gel and then you got to clean yourself, clean the device. Like, no, you don't have to do that. It's just a little bit of like skin lotion makes a huge difference. So, well, once again, everybody, this is the V Relief Prime um, from Hulus Performance Technologies. You can get the link to buy this in the, in the, notes below. Um, Nick, is there anything else that we want folks to know about this that we haven't talked about? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much more that we're learning about the nerve and its role in, you know, all kinds of health conditions, but also, you know, performance in general, everyday life performance. Um, you know, I, I was just doing some research on the economic cost of stress and anxiety uh, in the workplace. And, you know, there's a, there's a number that I was able to find that people that are living with high stress and anxiety on average are losing $3,400 per year in lost income, um, either due to missed work or poor job performance, um, or, you know, maybe just missed opportunities, right? They just weren't able to show up to something. Uh, and that, that's definitely, a lot more noticeable if you're like an athlete or something, right? If you miss a putt 
under pressure, you might've just lost out on half a million dollars or something. Um, So stress has a major impact, not just on your health, but on your finances and your ability to create the life that you want to live. And so this device, you know, its primary purpose is to help people calm themselves under pressure so that they can perform the way they're capable of performing. And I mean, that from day one, that was my biggest problem was I struggled to perform under pressure and I lost out on future opportunities because of it. Um, and it just sucks. It's like, man, I could have, I could have been somebody, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, this device, it considering just the impact that it can have on your future and your workplace performance, you know, it's priced at three ninety nine. It's really a much higher value than that, but like, that's a, that's an incredible investment in yourself, in your mental health, uh, physical health, but also your, you know, your future and your ability to perform, you know, in the workplace. And, you know, that, that's really the kind of perspective that um, I want to teach people is like, this is, it's not just like an instant, oh, I feel better now. Thanks. It's like, no, this is a long-term benefit beyond just helping you feel better. You know, you'll be able to perform better at work. You know, you'll show up more often. And you won't see the benefits like instantly for that. It's long term. But, you know, we're trying to help people like, you know, get back to the best versions of themselves and perform the way they're capable of. So, yeah, I think about this as like, wow, you know, how many of us, how many people do we all know that are struggling, you know, and with mental health issues who just can't settle down and can't handle the stress and they feel overwhelmed all the time? You know, what a great gift. Definitely Christmas present at the very least for for those yeah. folks it could really be a life game changing event um some of this might be illegal in, in the sports world right if it's a, if it's giving such a performance benefit um we'll see about that yeah yeah we'll see i mean that, that's been a question we i was uh, featured on an espn 30 for 30 documentary like the early days of our research because they heard we were doing golf studies and they asked me that question and at the time, you know, I didn't have, like, I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, what's out there. But now, I mean, these guys are using crazy technologies to improve performance. So I don't think this is actually, I don't even think anyone's going to ban this because, like, man, they use all kinds of wild stuff to improve performance and recovery. And um, I mean, just think like, you know, think like a massage gun, right? It's it, they're using mechanical energy to help you relax and calm down or recover. We're just using electrical energy. It's just a different energy form to do the same thing. Um, yeah, that's the argument I'm going to make. If any athlete commission ever comes after and says, "No, you're not allowed to use this," I'll be like, "Why not? What about all those other products? You got to ban those then too." But, Can you use it? As, do we, it would act as a muscle stimmer too, or would it not? Oh yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. definitely stimulate muscle with it. So you um, could actually put this on some sore muscles and help act, increase some blood supply and support some healing in that regard? Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's, you know, the same underlying technology. It's going to be, you know, down to the technical details. It'll be different than other, you know, muscle stimulators. But, um, I mean, you know it stimulates muscle because you get muscle twitching if you put it right. over a certain muscle. Sure. Um, it's kind of, you know, up to you to determine, like, you know, what muscle do we want to stimulate? One thing I found is when you, when you apply it to your body, it's a little less comfortable than kind of in the facial area. Um, but you just kind of play around with it, right? Like some, some places are fine. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of applications for it. Hmm. Nick, amazing. Once again, it's the, it's the coolest Technology, performance technologies. Nick created this amazing product that doesn't require gel and liquids to, to, to create a comfortable stimulation. Um, I think the the results for the folk for myself and the folks I've used this on, really amazing. Um, like I said, you can check out the link below, learn more about this on his website. And um, Nick, thank you so much. Hope to have you back when as this thing develops. I'm sure this is just the beginning of your of your uh, journey into into supporting vagal you know nerve technology and i really appreciate everything you're doing it's helping a lot of people i'm sure yeah no thank you for having me on the show and and just letting me get the story out uh we are 
by nature, we're an engineering company. You know, our company was founded by uh, engineers and designers. So we can't stop building stuff. We've got three other products that we've already built that aren't even publicly available yet. We're just kind of waiting to see how we're going to position them. But um, yeah, I mean, that's our mission is we want to help people recover from mental health, physical health issues without medications and just empower people to get back to you know who the best versions of themselves essentially so yeah appreciate the you know the opportunity to come on your show and talk to your audience so yeah Thank thanks for thanks for coming Nick. really appreciate it do you like this video don't forget to subscribe and share this recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.